Hey everyone, I'm Whitney, and this is the Reduce the Stigma podcast, the show that amplifies silence voices to combat stigma surrounding mental health, substance use, and challenging life experiences. A special thank you to our sponsors, Straight Up Care. Whether you're seeking support for mental health, substance use, recovery, or simply need a compassionate ear, there's a peer ready to support you. Straight Up Care, where recovery is powered by lived experience. And I'm going to start today by quoting our guest in their Doctorate of Education dissertation. Quote, while studies in classroom education may speak of health inequities occurring in the past, inequities leading to poor health outcomes continue today and will continue to occur until social determinants of health are properly addressed. So today we are going to explore how to address social determinants of health so that we can improve health outcomes. Get ready to be inspired. So today I'm talking with Dr. Grace Dernach Bonaventura, Chief of Staff at the School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh, where she supports the implementation of the Dean's initiatives. In addition to teaching undergraduates at Pitt School of Public Health, Dr. Dernach Bonaventura is also an adjunct instructor for Lamar University. Hello and welcome to Reduce the Sigma. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Dernach Bonaventura. Yeah, anytime. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited because I don't get to call you doctor very often. And what the audience doesn't know is that I have actually known you for several years and get to call you a friend. Um, And this is always special whenever I get to have someone I know uh, in a professional sense and personal sense on the show. So thank you for taking the time to do this with me. Oh, anytime. So, um, you know, I asked you to come on the show because you recently completed your uh, doctorate degree and defended your dissertation. And I thought it was a really interesting topic that you uh, really, you explored and researched. Can you give us an introduction, a summary of what it was that you chose to talk about in your dissertation. So briefly, I was looking into how to effectively teach social determinants of health in online undergraduate classes. Um, And the reason I chose this was that we were seeing in the healthcare field, the more of a focus of looking at holistic health and social determinants of health within an individual's care, but a gap in the knowledge of how to do that. Um, So really looking at it from a systemic level of how are we teaching it as early as undergraduate students, and then particularly for online students, since education is now also transitioning to a more of a hybrid of online learning and in-person learning. So I really focused on that online aspect of how do we teach social determinants of health in undergraduate students. That's such perfect timing that we had the conversation today because, um, just, I, th- I think it'll be two episodes before you, we had Dr. Orlando Wright on, who spoke about social determinants of health in the social work perspective and what he's doing to help train social workers. And I really am excited because what you're talking about is going to be not just you know social workers, but how do we expand the, the awareness of social determinants of health amongst all healthcare professionals, undergraduate students, and even what those barriers are to implementation of teaching those things. Is that correct? Yeah, so that is exactly correct. So why, you know, we've heard, we're hearing a lot of different things about social determinants of health, but why is it relevant to have them in these health-related courses? Well, healthcare in general is moving to look at social determinants of health as it makes up a majority of a person's overall physical and mental well-being. So that's important to be able to address in a healthcare setting. But it's also important to support the healthcare practitioner in how to address that. So we're looking into the educational system, how are teachers trained to be able then to talk to students about social determinants of health, which can become very uncomfortable if an instructor or a professor is not trained to do so, because it's a lot of uncomfortable conversations, a lot of historical knowledge we need to know. Um, So you mentioned about, you know, how are the teachers being trained? Is what, what's out there for teachers who want to integrate social determinants of health? I, I don't know if it's a curriculum standard at this point, if it's more based off of the faculty member or instructor bringing it into to students and classrooms. So from what 
I studied in my dissertation and what I found online. So it's not a, a comprehensive search of everything, but from what I was able to find was there are online guides to be able to integrate social determinants of health, but that takes a lot of extra time out of a teacher's personal life to go and look at that, see what it looks like. How do I integrate it? How do I update my curriculum? Um, when already, like many other professions, a lot of instructors don't have that time to be able to go search for the material, see what's relevant, and then update their own curriculum. You also have other indicators such as personal beliefs that play a role. So while we might find best practices and social determinants of health of talking about one particular area, an instructor's beliefs may not align with that. Or again, they may not feel comfortable being able to teach on that level um, with the students. So there are, there are guides that are on the internet, um, but they're not as visible if, unless somebody is proactively going to look for them. Right. So I'm, I'm guessing you have to want it before you can even find it to, to think to find it. Um, so it doesn't sound like there's much um, of a push uh, at a systems level yet to integrate it into these different areas. Would that be accurate? Yes, that is correct. A lot of areas or there's not as much of a guide. Again, we might say okay. from a more superficial level, okay, we want to include more on social determinants of health. But what does that look like, especially for online learning, where a lot yeah. of the literature points to, okay, we are going to go into a community center and see what this looks like um, from pr a practice-based experience or a case-based experience. But when we're online learning, there are many students who are coming from different parts of the country, different um, yeah, geographical areas overall. So that practice-based learning, is a, it looks a lot different when we're in an online setting. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so it's the why is is known, maybe acknowledged and being supported, but it's the how, especially. Okay, I'm understanding a little bit better now. And so you looked at applying the how, how to do it in that online setting. Can you tell us about what kind of things you tried with your students and what the results were? Sure. So from what I did, I looked at a lot of the literature, and there was one study by Brown et al. Um, I apologize for not knowing the et al. if you're listening in, but it was from Brown et al. And a really interesting part of their research was doing a photo essay assignment. And so when looking at that, I thought that was so interesting to be able to focus online students because they can talk about their own communities from a photo and not necessarily we don't have to be in the same space. So we did a photo essay assignment of looking into um, both what, what is a what is a health issue that you're experiencing in your community, whether it's your physical community or a community that you identify with? And then the students were asked to go take a photo of something that either was a barrier or something that supported their access to healthcare, or their, I should say, supported the optimal outcome of a health issue rather than access to healthcare. And so students could then talk about that. So students identified some things that were positive. So at the beginning, they might say that they lacked access to um, healthcare around or education on diabetes, but then they might also put up a billboard, like a picture of a billboard that they saw about fast food that was mm. in their community. And so they would talk about the promotion of this fast food in their community and how they don't have any signs that show the healthy foods. And then they could all have a conversation on what that looked like. So we, we did it from that perspective and looking at a peer-to-peer -peer dialogue as well. So what were other peers saying in terms of when they saw their students posting or their, their peers posting photos? Were they saying, yes, I agree with you. Is this something new I'm learning? Or this is also happening in my community as well. I also looked if they were talking about social determinants of health from a negative perspective or a positive perspective. Oftentimes when we think of social determinants of health, our minds could go into a negative. What are the barriers that we see? But social determinants of health could also be a very positive thing as we want to make sure that we're identifying the assets in our community and what we like about our community and being able to use those to to build on health or optimal well-being overall. Oh, I love that. I, I think naturally a lot of that 
we all tend to be a little bit more focused on the negative, what's missing or the barrier and not, you know, it's a strengths-based approach. Our resources, our communities, our social determinants of health can be the deciding factor in something good happening. Um, so what did you find with your students? Did you see, was there a uh, more positive than negative, vice versa, kind of a, an equal distribution? So at the beginning, I looked and there was a mix of how they talked about social determinants of health. And I break it into the, the different domains of social determinants of health. So how do we talk about education? So do they say, oh, uh, access to education to this materials promotes well-being again in diabetes awareness. That was often talked about a little bit more negatively, the lack of education around this health issue. But then there were more positive aspects on the other hand of, we have a lot of clinics in my area that provide health care. So access to care would be more viewed positively. So at the beginning, it was a mix. However, by the end, when students talked about their own communities, they often talked about them in a positive way, saying, this is the space that we have. So for example, they would talk about parks. We have access to a park in our community, which promotes healthy behaviors such as exercise. So even though they were thinking maybe in the beginning, a mix of negative and positive when talking about social determinants of health on a larger scale, when we talked about it in an online setting about their own communities, they often talked about it from a positive point of view and they may trickle in some barriers. So for example, the park space may not have shade all the time. And I live in a really hot community, so I can't go to all of the events, but they would still talk about having access to the park very positively. So our findings showed that students did talk about positive aspects of social determinants of health, really looking at an assets point of view and then when students responded to their peers, there was evidence of increased visibility of services. So students might say, I had no idea this existed in the community. I live in the same community. I didn't know this was here. Or if they're talking about communities such as the Hispanic community, they would they would often provide validation of what a student was saying. Like I, yes, like there are many, there are many stores, but there are not as many Hispanic stores. I, I hear you and I agree this is also happening in my community as well. So there was a lot of positive reinforcement with the peer-to-peer -peer learning. How neat. And it, it, I know this wasn't what you were looking at, but I can't help but wonder, you know, was it if they had been asked to identify those things before they were educated on social determinants of health, you know, what like the pretest would have been, what would their baseline, would they have been more maybe negative identifying the things missing? And then through the process, did they start identifying more positive because they were learning about the value? Like my psych mind is going into like, which came first kind of thing. Uh, so maybe somebody else who does a dissertation can explore that. Uh, yeah, in, because I will say, oh. if somebody does a dissertation, please explore it. But when I looked at the qualitative results of students' reflection, so their final assignment, they did a reflection. What did you learn most? Many students did state, I never knew that this was in my community before. Or I did, was, I did not realize that my community had so many similarities with other communities. So I think there is evidence of that to be able to springboard off of. But we did see some some themes emerged around this increased visibility of services and positive services within somebody's community. That's right. And you mentioned like positive interactions amongst the peers. I'm curious, you know, we're, we talk about stigma a lot and social determinants of health. There can be a lot of things that are factors in social determinants of health that can be looked down upon or dismissed and things like that. Did you and maybe this is more anecdotal than you have the analysis to support, but did you find any increased awareness and understanding or learning about one another and one another's communities through the project? So I don't have any evidence to back up that statement necessarily, but I would make an assumption that we do know that stigma was one of the sub themes especially oh. if we go through talking about mental health. So access to mental health, there is stigma in my community, whether that's, again, that's the physical community or an identity community. And having others read that there is stigma in that community would increase that awareness overall. Right. So while that wasn't a major theme, the fact that all students are reading each other's posts would increase that awareness of, okay, mental health is stigmatized. But here is a peer who's talking about it, and maybe I'm comfortable commenting on their post. Or I just never knew about that before. And they can walk away with that information and understanding communities' perceptions of maybe what is more stigmatized than others in certain communities as well. Wow. I, your students must have taken such 
or had such an amazing experience. It sounds very enlightening. Uh, I'm curious if they provided any feedback on that experience and if they'd recommend it for other students. They would miss I hope they recommended my class <laughs> in particular, but I think, well, what we sh what we saw in the evidence was that students really liked that peer-to-peer -peer interaction. When I asked about their reflections, and it was a reflection on the overall class, not necessarily that assignment in particular, but I did see evidence of many students saying, I really loved hearing from my peers and their experiences and what what was important to them or important in their community. So we saw that that was enlightening. Um, I'm hoping that they also saw the connections from a health issue to also their assets in their community. Again, looking at social determinants of health from a positive point of view. What do we have? What can we use in our community or build upon? So I'm hoping my students took that away. There was not as much that I saw emerging from that, but I think we could build upon that over yeah. the lifespan of a student's coursework. I like thinking about that. Uh, having this be something that isn't a one and done class, like so many things are, I imagine if we're really talking about addressing social determinants of health, it has to be integrated into each component of education. Um, like you said, even with, particularly with healthcare professionals. Absolutely. So with my course, we did the photo essay assignment, which was really fun, again, for me to do and see everybody's community. But it would be extremely boring if the students did that for every class. So if right. I'm talking to my peers, if this worked for me, you know, Whitney, if you're teaching a course too, like, I'm going to take that. My students are going to say, we already did this before. Like, why are we going to do right. it again? So it's important that this is just a small, tiny piece of, I can say, okay, this worked for my class, but it's important for me to then get with my other instructors and other peers and saying, what are you doing in your class? How is that working for you? So that I'm understanding the perspective that students are getting in, in your class. Mine is a little bit different, but it builds off of yours. If I'm talking about asset building in my class, does that come before you're talking about building a program and speaking with community members? Hmm. Where does that fit into a student's lifespan? So it's important to look at it from that level and really going to a chair of the department or even higher to see it from that bird's eye view of what is the lifespan of a student in understanding social determinants of health throughout their whole time in their undergraduate career. Yeah. Much easier said than done. Right. Yeah. Well, and that makes me think about your other point that you shared, which was um, not everyone knows how to do it. Not everyone is doing it and not everyone is comfortable doing it. So to have those conversations, you have to have other instructors addressing social determinants of health. Um, and I, I'm curious if we can go back there because we've now heard about your pro like at least one example um, uh, of how, how you integrated the photo essays. And so we see that how that was online. How what else is going on at the instructor level? I know that the resources aren't as aware, like aren't as visible or um, they're there, but not as known. What else? I think you've mentioned the discomfort in addressing and discussing social determinants of health. What can you tell us more about that? Sure. So that is really what started my dissertation. I saw in the field, this is actually where Whitney and I know each other. We used to work together. Uh, so I saw once again that healthcare professionals were being asked to address social determinants of health, but they were not provided the education on how to do so. Mm -hmm. So thinking about my own classroom, I thought, well, this is something I can have an impact on, but this makes me very uncomfortable. I'm not an expert. I'm not personally trained in social determinants of health. Yet if we're really going to address this, it needs to start in my own classroom and then expand outward. So it was incredibly uncomfortable. And the reason that I signed up to do a doctoral program was, okay, how do I, how do I have support in this? What does this look like for me as an individual, which I know is very, uh, as an aggressive take to take a whole doctoral program on to answer this one question and not something we can expect out of all um, my peer, peer instructors out there. But it is uncomfortable because we are addressing a lot of systemic issues. We're addressing a lot of issues without um, outside of our identities that we owe, that we have. So a lot of it is also understanding that I don't know everything and that I need to work with my community on what I can bring to the table, what can others bring to the table to give a well-rounded experience to the students while also being comfortable with my uncomfortability. So that's when I mess up and I maybe say something wrong, that's just addressing it in front of the class. Hey, I'm still working on this. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Even in this podcast, if I say something incorrectly, please let me know and I can address that and we could move forward. But it's 
it's knowing how to be uncomfortable, but still having those conversations. So once you see one instructor do it, for example, I have a, a good colleague that I see her do this in her classroom all the time. So then we can just converse with each other of what are you doing in your classroom? I'm uncomfortable and creating this community of let's just be open and honest about it while we are working for the common goal of moving this forward. So it's, it's always uncomfortable. It becomes more uncomfortable the more you know, because I realize that the more I know, the less I know. <laughs> but it's, again, it's something that has to be done. Healthcare isn't going to change. Social determinants of health, both positive and negative, are always changing, but they're always present. So we need to be able to address that. I am so glad you shared that and that you said, I am not an expert in social determinants of health. And I think for me, it highlights that I think there's this um, maybe an excuse we can sometimes use of I'm not the right person or I don't, I'm not an expert, so I shouldn't do it. What I'm seeing from you is that you don't have to be an expert to make an impact and do something, whatever it is that you can offer. Uh, and that's just really a different kind of mindset. Um, and hopefully that will inspire other people to say, okay, maybe I don't know everything about social determinants of health or stigma or what have you. Uh, I do know a little bit and I know that this one thing is, is something I can do. Um, and then get that ball, ball rolling. Like, you know, you have your other uh, colleague, you have your students now who've been exposed to it. Do you think that's part of it is just the gradual or I don't want to say gradual, but starting to just have the conversation, sitting in the discomfort. Absolutely. And I think it comes that we need to practice what we preach. So any instructor will say, students need to have a growth mindset. We're always learning. Even if you're in my classroom, you're going to learn more when they get out in the field. The same is also with instructors. So although I am an expert in the classes that I teach in the learning objectives that I teach, I am not an expert, as you said, in social determinants of health. Even though I did my dissertation, I'm an expert in my hypothesis in my own class in a controlled setting, but it's having that growth mindset of, okay, for example, I, I just finished my dissertation and I have this photo essay assignment. Wonderful. What am I doing with my other class that oh. I teach, right? Yeah. So it's, it's thinking that through and being uncomfortable. And then I think it's, it's verbalizing to others. So, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Isn't this cool? And then asking, what are you doing? Or, oh, maybe do, would you like to brainstorm together over a cup of coffee? Again, like many professionals, time is valuable. I know we don't have a whole ton of time to update curriculum, a whole ton of time to do much. That's just the reality. But then they can be more informal conversations that we have with our colleagues and holding each other accountable of being able to grow, being able to be uncomfortable together and integrating that so that our future colleagues who are our students have the skill set that they can build off. Of. I'm going to ask a question that you may have not thought about at all. So please feel free to say, I don't know. Uh, but I'm imagining, you know, that we're in a, a time when this is addressed more consistently and, you know, in, in online, in-person classes, healthcare non-healthcare maybe, uh, programs, what impact do you think it would have if we did have this topic more integrated and um, discussed in the education system? Noted question. <laughs> I know. What impact would it have? Well, hope, I mean, I, I don't know what impact it would have. I can tell you what I'm hopeful. It Let's go with that. What would you hope to I, see? I'm hopeful that we would have a more aware, more well-supported, I don't want to know necessarily if I want to use awareness, but a more well-supported healthcare system, right? So we, we've we given the tools to healthcare professionals on addressing social determinants of health, because right now it is not fair for us to expect healthcare professionals to address health social determinants of health as broad as it is with, with no support. So I think it would look like support for healthcare professionals, which would then in turn support people in the community. If we understood that and we gave them the tools, then we could do that overall. We could support communities to have better health, better well-being, you know, whether that's physical, social, spiritual, mental. That would be the ideal. That's a very big picture, but that would be my hope and dream. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Well, 
we now know that we're one step closer to it with a, a, at least like one class closer to it. So that's great. Um, and if I can, I'd like to go a little bit in a different direction um, because something that not everyone who, who will read your dissertation or, uh, you know, have you as a faculty, as an instructor in the future will know is that you were working on your dissertation, presented and defended it while uh, nine, nine months pregnant. You were nine months pregnant yes, the was. day of your dissertation defense, um, which is incredible. I remember thinking, what is she thinking? <laughs> I, I'm curious what that was like and if there was any different experience you think you had as a result of being not only pregnant, but very close to, to delivery uh, at this pivotal moment of your education and career. You do also focuses on stigma. So I can definitely tie it to that as well. Um, so yes, I was nine months pregnant when I defended my dissertation and it was very much evident at that point. But even going through the process, it, it was both internally motivating for me as a positive. I knew that I, I wanted to get this done. I needed to have all my revisions and get all my meetings and be really focused on having this complete before my daughter was born. Unfortunately, um, she was not early. Okay. <laughs> she came on time, but I did, there was a lot of feedback of, Oh, are you, are you going to finish? Which I thought was an interesting question because yes, I am, but I understand. But also the experience of some some individuals who would then say, oh, it doesn't matter that you're going to finish because your priorities are going to change. And of course, my priorities change if you have a child, but that doesn't mean that my dissertation or my doctorate or my work life was less important to me overall. And so that was interesting to try to respond to in a positive manner of, oh, it, you'll be fine. I mean, your priorities will change anyway, where uh, I'd like to toot my own horn, like, you know, I published while I was out on maternity leave and I like to show my daughter that we could do both of these things. So it was a very interesting experience um, to defend while pregnant, both motivating internally while navigating the field of people assuming what I would prioritize and not prioritize after I gave birth. Glad you tooted your own horn I will. Uh, be because that is, um, I mean, it is an Doing a dissertation, defending it in, an, in a, a, a doctoral program in and of itself is a significant achievement. Uh, and to do that while navigating one of the most significant experiences a female body can go through is tremendous. Like, I mean, that is, a, you know, a, a really inspiring uh, action. And it, you know, hearing that even still today, those types of comments are made is, it's, it's really sad. It and, is really sad. Yeah. And I am also caught by how, uh, y there was also the, the comment of like, I understand uh, that why they're asking, but I'm curious, should we be understanding of why someone would ask that? Or should we be seeing it as you wouldn't, would you ask a man that or, or someone who, or a partner who maybe isn't bearing the child? Yeah, I think that's a question I would have liked to have been asked about my pregnancy and maybe, maybe how, how is that going with your dissertation? Are you feeling okay? Um, asking it more open-endedly would be wonderful. And I know people had great intentions, so it also could have been the wording and not understanding what they're saying, or again, putting their own preferences on my life. But yes, I do think it's something that should be acknowledged while at the same time, not making assumptions about what will happen in the future. I think it was a lot of the, what this will happen if you get it. So you'll, you'll no longer need your dissertation. You no longer need your doctorate because <laughs> your priorities will change. But nobody ever asked me to be candid. Are you going to come back to work? Are you going to stay home? They didn't ask me those out front, but there were a lot of assumptions made. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Why would I put in these years of work for my dissertation 
And if I chose to stay home, that's also perfectly fine. Maybe I wanted to have my doctorate for myself and stay at home with my child. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Right. But for me, I chose to go back to work, uh, but it was, it was an interesting experience. And I think, again, people are allowed to have conversations about it without making general assumptions. And as you said, so uh, my partner, he did not have any questions regarding his return to work or it was going to happen after the baby gets here. And none of that, again, it, but it's not as visible for him either, where there's a visible sign when I go into my dissertation of, oh, she's very pregnant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, you certainly have a very uh, impressive position uh, already and, and had that prior to, to defending your dissertation. Uh, a lot of people, though, are looking for a career move uh, upon accomplishing a degree. And whenever, you know, a woman is pregnant uh, and and going and pursuing these, that is, like you said, it can't be hidden, nor should someone feel like they have to hide it. And when those thoughts that some people just blatantly shared with you of, oh, you won't want to come back or it won't matter. Unfortunately, I, that's happening in choosing who to hire, um, who to put on tenure track. Uh, and it's really hindering the, the growth of women uh, in the professional world. So I will agree and disagree. Oh, I love it. Yes. So I know in my experience, although I gave some examples of what people have said, they're not necessarily all people in the workspace. Um, my own office has been very supportive of my leave, my return, checking in to make sure I'm, I'm doing well with reintegrating it back to the workspace. Cause that is real, even though I want to be back at work, making that transition and still talking to me about my doctor. Okay. Now you're Dr. Dernash Bonaventura. Like, you know, here's how we're going to use that moving forward. And so there are supportive environments that exist. There are individuals that'll ask those questions that'll really get under your skin, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's outside of the workplace, because that did happen, you know, not just in the workplace setting, but I will say there are environments because my office here has been very supportive upon my return. And I like to brag about that a little bit. Um, and I'd actually also like to go back to a point of, when somebody decides to go get their doctorate, I, you know, when I decided and started the program, I was not pregnant at the time. And I, I go back to when I was attending, it's more about the why. So again, turning it back to, I started my doctorate because I was uncomfortable talking about social determinants of health in my class. Yeah. And so at the very least, I am now more uncomfortable talking about social determinants of health because again the more you know potentially the more you become uncomfortable but i will i do it more so for me i still feel that sense of accomplishment whether or not i would use that to advance my career or not i did it for myself and yeah. then fortunately i will advance because i have a very supportive work environment but that is not the case for many people who choose to bear children and have children overall Yes. And so for those who are like, why, why did we go onto this pathway when we started talking about? Because work, the work environment, financial stability, that's all social determ that, that implies that's part of social determinants of health. Um, and that's just another way that we're probably not realizing the things that impact our health. You that access to education. Yeah. Yeah. And conversations like this, uh, I couldn't help but really love when in your dissertation, when you mentioned, and in this interview too, you talk about the peers talking and sharing their stories. There's so much power to just learning about another's perspective and experiences. That's what we do here. And it's just more reinforcement that conversation can be such a dynamic experience and a, a a catalyst for growth and change. And I think when we have conversation, an important part of that conversation is understanding where you are in the power dynamic. So for me as an instructor, listening to students' first person perspectives, they are being, they know that they are being graded from me, whether I'm thinking about that when I'm reading their experiences or not. So 
I'm going to get on my little soapbox of having an, an equitable rubric when we're doing these types of activities so that students, if they feel comfortable sharing their stories, they can and they know exactly how they're being graded, which should take all of the personal information out. But yeah, that's, that's a whole other tangent that I can go off of for another, another time for us, Whitney. But I think yes. when we say conversations in the listening piece, really listening to somebody else rather than coming in and saying, okay, this is exactly what I know and this is my experience. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I'm going to end the stage right. It, hey, tell me about what, like, Whitney, what are you, what are you talking about with social determinants? Felt like you even brought up us talking about this, how important it is, and just gave me pause to think, absolutely, absolutely it is. So I think highlighting the listening aspect of conversations is something collectively we could all work on, myself included. Yeah. Yes as I respond immediately before taking a moment to really listen. No, I am listening. And uh, yeah, we really could continue going on and maybe uh, we'll do that with whatever your next significant, well, it doesn't even have to be uh, externally significant, but um, you know, I really enjoyed this. And I, before I get to my final question uh, that I ask everyone, um, how can people connect with you if they want to be more aware of your work? Are you uh, on LinkedIn or, or what would be the best way? I am on LinkedIn. I check it about every two weeks. So that might professionally be the best way, but please, uh, I'm, I don't like to live in a world of immediacy. So shoot me a message on LinkedIn. I'm the only Dernach Bonaventura out there. <laughs> uh, and I will respond in, you know, seven to 14 business days. There you go. And I appreciate that, that boundary setting for yourself. Um, and we will certainly share that information as well as a link to your dissertation and the resources that I know you reference in your dissertation for those uh, instructors who are interested in starting to incorporate SEOH into their uh, classes. So then moving on to my last question, uh, we've talked about a lot of really meaningful things and hopefully people were listening and you know, taking time to, to reflect, um, if they can only take one thing away from this conversation, what would you like it to be? I think it would be, it's okay to feel uncomfortable talking about social determinants of health. And I encourage you to have a conversation with a colleague, someone you trust to discuss your uncomfortability, because then you could be comfortable talking about that as a very first step. That is what I encourage any listener to do. Wonderful. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time for exploring this topic and, and being willing to, you know, share your reflections and experience with us. Well, it's always nice to see you, Whitney, of course. <laughs> you too. And for all of you who enjoyed this and took something away from it, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share. As always, the best way to help raise awareness and bust stigma is to just have these conversations, to be okay being a little uncomfortable with these tough topics, and to share it with someone who it may resonate with. So every time you share, you're helping us to you know, just reduce the stigma out there and increase the acceptance and awareness. So thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.